Hi, this is Frank Taylor with Nature at Your Door. Today, I'm not at my door, but I'm at the door of a shelter on the Appalachian Trail. And actually, I think you can see that this shelter doesn't actually have a door. Appalachian Trail shelters are always closed on three sides and open on the other side, but it does provide some shelter for the rain. Last night, I slept in a tent here. I enjoy sleeping in my own tent. And today's episode is going to be on a tree called serviceberry or shadbush. And it's a tree that's very common on the northeast coast, but it's easily recognizable because it flowers way, way before any other tree flowers. So today's episode is going to be on a tree called the serviceberry. And also my experience in watching spring unfold as I went from 2,000 feet to about 3,300 feet, the climate changed. And for every 100 feet of elevation, it sends you back several days in the spring. So I've been able to relive the onset of spring over and over again, as told by the stories of different wildflowers. At the top of the peaks, no plants. At the down in the valleys, all kinds of wildflowers were visible. So today's episode, biology of the serviceberry tree, otherwise known as shadbush, and the best part is the stories that relate to the names of these trees. So stay tuned. Right here in your backyard, you never know what you're gonna find. And here's the make this invasive. It's exotic. Dogwoods are flowering. And I just took a couple swipes of terrestrial environment. Uh, produce seed pollen. And it's. You frequently hear me talking about how I live in the Appalachian Mountains. And I, in fact, I really identify with Appalachian Mountains. In fact, I built a house at 2,700 feet with views in the Appalachian Mountains and even built a log cabin with trees that I cut down myself and hand peeled the bark. So today I'm actually on the Appalachian Trail in Virginia in Shenandoah National Park. So I'm going to show you some things about the Appalachian Trail, things you'll see in addition to talking about the shadbush or serviceberry tree that just really captivated and fascinated me. This is a serviceberry behind me right here on the Appalachian Trail. It's sort of stand alone. There aren't any leaves out on the trees yet. There's very little greenery even on the ground. Here is serviceberry flowering behind me. It's so cool. And I've never seen a stand of them. There's always been like one tree. You go a half mile or a mile, and then there's another one, and maybe one 100 yards away. But they always seem to be isolated on their own. And you can see it's not a very large tree, but it's really striking to see it in the forest at this time of the year. We're here at about 2,200 feet right now, I'm coming down in a gap off a 3,000 to 3,500 foot ridge where the trail is going along at the top of this ridge. So for me, it's always startling to be walking through seemingly a winter landscape and then all of a sudden, boom, there's a tree in the mass of background of gray with these brilliant, beautiful white flowers. Absolutely the first flowering tree in the Appalachian forest, but also one of the first flowering trees really anywhere on the east coast of the United States. There are several species. They all have these brilliant flowers. The flowers themselves, you can see here, are five-petaled and have very distinct stamens and pistils. Sometimes the petals are drooping, sometimes they're held upright. They're generally this brilliant white, but sometimes they'll have shades of pink in them as well. I'm absolutely fascinated by the different names. It's called serviceberry, it's called shadbush, it's called juneberry, and the indigenous peoples called it the Saskatoon tree. It's also known as sugar plum or wild plum. I'm always fascinated by the origins of these names. The name Juneberry comes from the fact that these flowers will reveal 
these almost blueberry-like berries on the tree that are really delicious. And these berries were used both by the indigenous peoples and early settlers and people today in anything that you would do with berries, like making jams and jellies, pies and cobblers. And of course, it's Juneberry because the berries ripen in June and they are a favorite for birds and wildlife. Service berry tree gets a lot of regional name. In places where shad run up rivers, it's called shad bush because the flowering period seems to coincide with the same time in the spring that the shad run up the rivers to breed. My personal favorite name for this tree is service berry because of the folklore in the Appalachians that are associated with this particular name. So the Appalachian Mountains had these communities that were way, way up in the mountains a century ago. And to reach them, you had to go up these uh, steep, gravelly, dirt roads. And in the winter time, the preachers, the itinerant preachers that went from church to church to preach aren't able to get up in the mountains on these roads. So the presence of the serviceberry flowers singled springtime and the ability for the itinerant preachers to get back up in the mountains and do the services. Another associated naming folklore is that the service berry marks the time where the ground is also thawed. And in the winter time, you were able to dig through the frozen ground to do a burial. So this is the time that you had a service and went ahead and dug the graves. After flowering, elliptical, oblong, unremarkably shaped leaves with a serrated edge will appear. And these leaves will turn a beautiful red orange in the fall and makes it a really neat tree to plant. The fruit it produces actually aren't berries. They're technically, biologically, a pome, which is like an apple with a fleshy exterior and the seeds buried inside. The bark is gray and tends to break up as the tree gets older. And when it's younger, sometimes you can see these sort of uh, striations in the bark, these lines going up and down its length. The wood of shadbush is very hard and historically, was used for tool handles and fishing rods, while the Native Americans used it for the shafts of arrows. In an era of invasive species, this is a great tree for plantings in your yard. It produces flowers, it produces these great berries, it has huge wildlife value, it's host for many different species of butterflies and moss. It's really just a great all-around small tree, flowering tree to have in your property. The Appalachian Trail switches from the south slope to the north slope and follows along this ridge and goes up and goes down. I keep walking back into winter and then forward into spring. As I go higher in elevation, I go back into winter and I see some of the first blooming wildflowers. As I go down the slope to lower elevation, I follow spring, uh, its succession of blooming flowers. And the same thing with north slope and south slope. So as I hiked the trail, I saw such an array of wildflowers, like these different kinds of violets, including a white, yellows, and these bird tooth violets. It was so cool as I walked down the hill into springtime, away from the barren, cold upper ridges, I saw such great stuff. In addition to service berry blooming, I also saw spice bush blooming and got to observe these ferns coming up out of the ground in their classic fiddlehead shape. As I walked up to the tops of ridges, I would see bloodroot, the first of the spring wildflowers coming up. And then on the bottom of the ridges, down spring was much more advanced, and I would see things like mayapple that typically come out much later in the season. These wildflowers, like the trilling arbutus and the star chickweed and these different phloxes, follow a distinct successional pattern in the spring. Certain flowers will bloom first. And I was able to follow that succession of spring both up and down the mountain and on north slopes and south slopes. And here is an amazing wood betony. Well, I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of Nature at Your Door. I'm fascinated by the trees and the history behind many of them, like serviceberry or shadbush. 
And I hope you enjoyed getting a glimpse of the trail and get an appreciation for the effect of climate, elevation, and north and south slopes on the microclimates that affect the onset of spring and growth during the summer and overall the ecology of a certain slope and the species that live there based on all of those variables. Thanks for watching. If you like what I do, please subscribe and I hope to see you in the next episode.